Tsukui Gardner VOD, I am Tad Larkin, the Lore Master of Mandalore, and today I'll be digging through the archives to elaborate on the feared Kalish cyborg, General Grievous. On the virulent jungle world of Kali, on the fringes of the Outer Rim, the being that would eventually become the ruthless cyborg General Grievous was born a full flesh and blood Kalish male by the name of Kamayan Jai Shalal. At an early age, Kamayan's father put a Zerka slug thrower in his hands and trained him to be a warrior, as his people were under constant threat from the insectoid Yamirai, better known as the Huck, who frequently traveled from their neighboring system to Kali to take Kalish slaves. After his father died in battle, he inherited the traditional Mamu skull commonly worn by Kalish warriors, and by the time Kamayan reached his 20s, he was considered somewhat of a demigod amongst his people, after having killed over 40 Huck by the age of 8 and countless more afterwards. Kamayan's battle prowess alone arguably turned what was once a fight for survival against the Huck into a full-fledged war, a winnable war. But while the Kalish sought victory on the battlefield, he found something he did not expect. Love. She came to him in a dream, a warrior goddess dual-wielding a pair of traditional Kalish leg swords, hunting wild Mamu in the Kunbal jungle. And when he himself went out into the jungle, he found her just as he dreamt. Rondaru Lij Kumar. And like the ancient Kalish tale of the dreamer and the dreamt one, he was instantly smitten. Kamayan and Rondaru carved a swath through the Huck invaders in numerous battles, her teaching him the art of swordsmanship, and him teaching her the refined techniques of using a precision rifle. Together, they seemed unstoppable. However, it wasn't destined to last, as during one engagement, Rondaru was cruelly taken from him, impaled on Huck pincers and cast into the sea where he was never able to recover her. Bitter and broken, he sought the help of his gods in bringing his love back to him, but he was met with no answer. He tried taking to wife ten other Kalish females and fathering thirty children, but even that failed to dull his pain. His sorrow soon turned into anger. Fueled by the immense hatred he had for the Huck and casting aside his birth name, Kamayan dubbed himself Grievous, and raising an elite force of Kalish warriors called the Izvoshra, waged total war against the Huck, eventually driving them off Kali and chasing them back to their home system, eradicating many of their colonies along the way. Therein lied Grievous's mistake. By pursuing the Huck back to their home star system, they pleaded their case before the Galactic Republic Senate, and made the Kalish look like the aggressors. So, the Jedi intervened and stopped the Kalish in their tracks, forcing an end to the conflict, sanctioning an embargo on Kali, and ordering Kali to pay war reparations to the Huck. Thus began Grievous's hatred for both the Jedi and the Republic. Almost too conveniently, Grievous was approached by the Intergalactic Banking Clan, where, if he agreed to sign on as one of their enforcers, essentially leading the IGBC's droid forces to secure debts from defaulting customers, they would in turn take on Kali's debts and aid in restarting trade, which would relieve the planet of its ongoing famine, so he accepted the offer. Sometime around 29 Galactic Standard years before the Battle of Yavin, a resuming of hostilities with the Huck inspired Grievous to return home, forsaking his contract to fight alongside his comrades once more, which angered the IGBC. But instead of simply accepting the loss of a fierce warrior and gifted tactician, they had other plans in store for him partnering with Geonosian Archduke Poggle the Lesser, and a former Jedi by the name of Count Dooku, now the Sith Lord Darth Tyrannus, as well as his master, Darth Sidious. Now back on Kali, Grievous boarded a shuttle with a few of his Izvoshra warriors bound for Huck space to rendezvous with the rest of his forces. But before they could even exit Kali's atmosphere, an ion bomb planted in the shuttle exploded and it plunged into the sea where the mangled remains of Grievous' body were recovered by Dooku and brought to Geonosis. To ensure Grievous remained stable, Dooku not only shocked his heart back to life, but also gave him a blood transfusion from the deceased Jedi Master Sifo Dias, which also served as an experiment to see if non-Force sensitives could become Force sensitive after receiving a midichlorian rich blood donation. Grievous was kept alive, but did not become Force sensitive. 
Awaking in a Bacta tank, Grievous floated before Banking Clan Chairman San Hill, who gave him one last proposition. Be forced to die in a manner unbefitting of a venerable warrior such as himself, or volunteer to be cybernetically augmented, and lead armies of battle droids for a new government against the Republic, where he would be allowed to return home after the war. Grievous reluctantly chose the latter. Given the severe extent of his injuries, the technicians were only able to save his brain, eyes, spinal cord, and major organs, so an entirely new body had to be built for him. Heavy-duty Durasteel served as the basic skeletal frame, then reinforced with duranium armor plates on the legs, arms, shoulders, neck, and chest, which housed and protected his surviving organs, sealed in a pressurized synth skin sack. The head and cranium were also duranium, but molded to look like his iconic Mamu skull mask, while inside, his brain was augmented with a series of electrodes that interfaced with his body, and the parts of his brain that dealt with aggression, motor skills, and memory were enhanced and modified. His eyes were also enhanced with cybernetic implants to increase his perception and allow him to keep up with the hyperfast movements his body was now capable of making. An ultrasonic vocabulator allowed him to speak, while audio receptors on either side of his head transmitted sound to his brain. Advanced electro drivers in his arms and legs were now capable of accelerating his limbs to Jedi like speeds, and each of his hands contained six fingers with two opposable thumbs, which allowed Grievous to split his arms apart and wield four lightsabers at once. Lastly, his reptilian like LX 44 series legs, also reinforced with duranium armor plates, boasted powerful magnetized talons on his feet, which not only allowed him to stabilize and scale vertical surfaces, but they too could also hold a lightsaber. Grievous was unsurprisingly unhappy with his new station in life. He was disgusted by his new mechanical form and the discomforting problems that came with it. He hated his IG series Magna Guards and deemed them inferior to his Isvostro warriors. And most of all, hated being called a droid, which Dooku, his new master essentially, made an effort to regularly refer to him as to elicit his rage. Upon his re-emergence as General Grievous, Dooku bestowed upon him the honor of Supreme Commander of the Droid Armies of the newly founded Confederacy of Independent Systems as of 24 BBY, and relinquished a gift, the green-bladed lightsaber of his old friend from his days in the Jedi Order, Master Sifo Dyas. In a barbaric fit of rage, Grievous used the elegant Jedi weapon to smash his Magna Guards in what he saw as open defiance to Dooku, but this did nothing but please the Sith Lord. Now the General's training could truly begin. If Grievous was going to contend with the best of the Jedi, Dooku, being a master swordsman himself, began training the Kalish Cyborg in the basic forms of lightsaber combat, then moving on to the more complex forms. Meanwhile, Grievous made major modifications to his bodyguards, updating their programming so that they could learn from their sparring matches, and gave them the traditional Kalish wrappings of his Izvoshra warriors, all while gaining respect for Dooku and Lord Sidious. In 22 BBY, the Clone Wars finally erupted when the newly established Grand Army of the Republic, as well as 200 Jedi, intervened in the signing of an arms agreement and execution of two Jedi and a Senator on Geonosis. But Dooku did not deem the time right to reveal the existence of General Grievous to the Republic just yet, and had him guard the Separatist leaders while the battle unfolded. As he was escorting them to their hangar to evacuate towards the end of the battle, him and his Magna Guards were intercepted by Jedi Master Ursima Du and a strike team of clone troopers. He left none alive, and added his first earned lightsaber to his collection. Following the CIS defeat at Geonosis, Dooku continued to hold Grievous in reserve, allowing other Separatist generals such as Severance Tan and even Dooku himself to lead campaigns in the early months of the war. The time to reveal himself to the Republic finally came four months after the Battle of Geonosis, when a task force led by seven Jedi assaulted the major Bactoid manufacturing world of Hypori, and General Grievous was charged with the planet's defense. Before the Republic was even able to land ground troops, Grievous lured their space forces into a minefield, sending a majority of their fleet plunging towards the desert world's surface, while the remainder was mopped up by his own forces. 
Outmanned, outgunned, and outmaneuvered, the surviving clones and Jedi emerged from the wreckage of their Acclimator-class assault ships and held off the onslaught of super battle droids as best as they could. However, every last clone of the Task Force and Jedi General Doc Menbarek were mowed down by Grievous's initial onslaught. The six remaining Jedi, Kiadi Mundi, his Padawan, Tar Seer, Shak T, Ayla Sakura, Kakruk, and Barek's now orphaned Padawan, Sha'a Gi, held up in an acclimator wreck as Grievous sent wave after wave of droids against them, before going in himself to finish off the Jedi. Grievous made quick work of the two Padawans, injured Shak T and Ayla, nearly killed Kakruk, who immediately slowed his vitals to an almost death state to enter a healing trance, and engaged in a protracted duel against Kiadi Mundi, who, if it were not for an extraction team of ten advanced recon clone troopers led by Captain Fordo, he himself may have fallen to the general. Impressed by his martial prowess and tactical skill he demonstrated at Hypori, Dooku put Grievous through another test. This time, aboard a derelict scientific station, he sent two of his most promising servants against him, the Jendai bounty hunter Dirge and the Ratatakai dark Jedi acolyte Asajj Ventress, who both fell to Grievous, but he was ordered to spare them by Dooku. Now that he was finally leading campaigns against the Republic out in the open, Grievous chose not one, but three different Providence-class cruisers as his flagships, Invisible Hand, Lucid Voice, and Colicoid Swarm, and would interchange them so that his enemies never knew which ship he was aboard, and sometimes the sheer presence of one of these ships was enough to force entire star systems to surrender. At Nadim, the General suffered a setback when, after being denied air superiority by Jedi General Saisi Teen's fighter wing, General Luminara Unduli and her Padawan Barris Offi utilized guerrilla tactics to successfully stave off Grievous' advances and were able to defend the world from his assault. A similar setback was experienced on Vidav, only this time the Separatist retreat was planned, as Grievous had rigged an enormous amount of mining detonators to explode 15 minutes after his forces retreated, which would decimate Republic ground troops as well as their native allies. However, the sequence was interrupted by a lone ARC trooper. Minor setbacks aside, a year and ten months into the war, Grievous launched his most daring offensive against the Republic yet. Operation Dirge's Lance, where, leading the CIS 1st and 3rd fleets staging at Yog Duel, he blazed the path of destruction up the Corellian Trade Spine and into the heart of the Core Worlds. At Duro, Grievous' forces smashed the Republic's defenses, and collateral damage from the battle was so extensive that it left the planet's surface completely uninhabitable, and the Duros were forced to move into hermetically sealed floating cities following their capitulation to the General. The five worlds of the nearby Corellia system were terrified that they'd be Grievous' next target. However, the city world of Humbrain was next in his sights, and after orbitally bombarding the planet into rubble, he moved on to Lordovia, where he released a nasty brain rot plague that killed the entire human population of the Weemel sector. The General's war atrocities didn't stop there. He moved on to Kaikelius and finally Alderaan, where fighting there was so fierce that after fending off the CIS invasion, the Alderaanians voluntarily gave up their weapons and dismantled what little military capability they had left at that point. Before he could continue his rampage through the Core Worlds, Grievous was recalled to the Outer Rim to see to the kidnapping of Republic Ambassador Quian on Vandos, as well as beginning preparations for a CIS invasion of the system. A strike team led by Jedi Masters Tachuka Toon and Jamar was sent to Vandos to rescue the Ambassador. However, they weren't prepared for Grievous, who had recognized the two Jedi Masters as the very same who mediated the end to the First Huck War, and imposed the debilitating sanctions on his people. So he took great pleasure in their deaths, as Toon's Padawan completed the extraction. Toon's Padawan, Flynn Kaibo, in open defiance of the Jedi Council, began searching for Grievous and collecting others, Jedi and normal folk alike, who also recognized the threat that he posed and the need to eliminate him. 
Grievous, meanwhile, on his way to organize an offensive in the Anoat system, ambushed a Republic allied Mon Calamari vessel, and during the boarding action, discovered seven Jedi younglings after quickly dispatching their guardian. Continuing his assault on the Ugnaught homeworld of Gentes, capturing their manufacturing capabilities and brutalizing the surviving Ugnaught populace, he contemplated presenting his newly captured younglings to Dooku for Sith indoctrination, but Dooku himself gave him the go-ahead to conduct his own cybernetic experiments. Following their first escape attempt, Grievous forced the unruly children to watch in horror as he rounded up the surviving Ugnaught populace in the city, placing them in the assembly hall, and promptly bombarding the structure from orbit. In another escape attempt, the younglings unwittingly led Grievous to a secret underground refuge, where a lot of the Ugnaughts retreated to during the defense of their capital city. And right as Grievous decided that they were no longer worth his effort, Flynn Kaibo and his companions arrived. While the younglings were successfully rescued, the main goal of their mission, the elimination of General Grievous, was not achieved, and Flynn Kaibo lost his life while engaging him one-on-one -on -one while the others fled. With an influx of new Victory and Venator-class warships, Phase II clone armor, and a multitude of new vehicles and equipment, the Republic launched a series of offensives that undid all of Grievous's progress during the Dirge's Lance operation and effectively confined the CIS in the Outer Rim, culminating in the Outer Rim sieges. However, this was all according to the wishes of his masters, and Grievous was ordered to simply prolong the war as long as he could. For every star system that the Republic took, he'd simply take another, turning their massive push into a grinding war of attrition. He was present at the Battle of Boz Pity, two years and seven months into the war, where, while staging at the Graveyard World, the Republic launched an all-or-nothing assault in an attempt to eliminate him, Dooku, and Asajj Ventress all at once. Grievous was presented with a proverbial buffet of Jedi. Carving his way through scores of clone troopers, he killed Jedi Master Soon Bates as well as Adi Galea, and was just about to meet his match when Mace Windu challenged him, but was knocked back by an explosion. At Dooku's behest, the Magna Guards recovered the battered and sparking Cyborg General, leaving Ventress to her fate while the rest of the Separatist forces withdrew from the planet. Making the necessary repairs following the mishap on Boz Pity, Grievous led a relief force to the besieged Techno-Union Citadel world of Zegaba, and arrived just in time to find a very young Boba Fett attempting to assassinate the Techno-Union foreman Wat Tambor, and, intervening, the miniature bounty hunter barely escaped with his life. In the aftermath of losing the Trade Federation purse worlds of Koru, Deku, and Kato Naimoidia, General Grievous was tasked with finding a new stronghold for the members of the Separatist Council, and sought to take one, the seemingly undefended world of Belderone. Much to the General's surprise, an entire Republic fleet was waiting for him in Belderone's orbit, as, during the Battle of Kato Naimoidia, Newt Gunray accidentally left behind his Mechno chair, and the Republic was now using it to unencrypt transmissions to predict enemy fleet movements, forcing Grievous to retreat, taking out a convoy of civilian refugees to cover his jump. If it weren't for Gunray's status and importance to the war, Grievous would have smashed the face of that grubby little Nymoidian coward for compromising not only their secret encryptions that cost him the battle, but perhaps even the existence of Darth Sidious himself. After the Belderone debacle, Grievous moved the Separatist leaders to the windswept sinkhole world of Utapau that he had subjugated two years earlier, and installed a more permanent presence on the world, much to the chagrin of the native Utai and Powans. In 19 BBY, during one of his final sparring matches with Dooku to ensure he maintains his combat edge even during his downtime, the Sith Lord cautioned him about taking unnecessary risks bidding Grievous to withdraw from any engagements where the risk of death was too great. After the eliminations of Ventress, Dirge, Sora Bulg, and several other of Dooku's acolytes, Grievous's survival grew more important every day. This advice was just in time for a transmission from Darth Sidious, who gave Grievous his most important assignment yet. Using secret hyperspace routes through the Deep Core, he was to assemble a massive fleet and attack the Republic capital on Coruscant, and kidnap Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. 
Grievous's first wave pounded the unsuspecting Coruscant defense fleet, and as panicked calls for nearby fleets to come to the planet's defense went out, droid forces commenced a surface attack, drawing Republic ground troops away from the Senate district where Grievous and his Magna Guards infiltrated. Smashing through the window of the Chancellor's office, Grievous mowed down squads of clones and Senate guards, as Jedi Masters Shock T, Roran Karab, and Falmu Donna ushered Palpatine down the hall and into the turbo lift as fast as they could, in an attempt to get Palpatine to his emergency bunker. Through alleyways, marketplaces, sky lanes, and atop maglev trains, Grievous and his Magna Guards pursued the Chancellor and his Jedi protectors, but just when they believed they safely made it to the bunker, Grievous materialized out of the shadows, making quick work of the Ithorian and Tal's Jedi with his four lightsabers. Following a delaying action to tie up Grievous's Magna Guards, Shock T arrived just as her comrades were slain and Grievous had the Chancellor literally in hand. And instead of simply killing her as he had tried to on Hypori, this time Grievous bound her with electrified cables so she could tell the tale of what happened. As Grievous walked the boarding ramp with Palpatine to his personal shuttle, Mace Windu intercepted them, and although he acted quickly to shove the Chancellor into the shuttle while he dealt with the Jedi, Windu used the Force to crush his Duranium chest plates, causing more damage to his already poorly augmented lungs, and with that, the shuttle wasted no time taking off. With the Chancellor now secure aboard Invisible Hand's observation deck, Grievous quickly underwent repairs to get back to the bridge as soon as possible. However, his lungs were now filling up with fluid worse than before, adding a wheezing cough to his already rasping voice. Now the trick was to maneuver Invisible Hand out of the battle and into a position where he could make the jump to hyperspace, but the thickness of the fighting kept him at Coruscant long enough for reinforcements from the Open Circle fleet to arrive, fresh from their operations at Nelvan and Tithe. Flying their Eta-2 Actus Jedi Interceptors, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker blasted their way into Invisible Hand's main hangar bay, and hacked their way through battle droids until coming to the observation deck, where, after dueling and killing Count Dooku, the Chancellor was recovered. Back on the command bridge, Grievous was far too busy to monitor what was going on in the observation salon. Several ships had been harassing Invisible Hand on its escape vector, including a Carrick class cruiser commanded by Lorth Nita, and a full-on broadside from the Venator class Star Destroyer Guaralara, which temporarily sent the vessel spiraling. Finally appraised of the situation, Grievous ordered ray shields to be activated in Hallway 328 where they were currently escaping, and droids were sent to apprehend the would-be Jedi heroes and bring them to the bridge. Their captivity wouldn't last long, R2-D2 provided a distraction and the former Master Apprentice duo were able to reclaim their lightsabers from Grievous's cape with the Force, and chaos broke out aboard the bridge as lightsabers and magna staffs blared to life. With his guards dispatched and his bridge crew abandoning their stations, General Grievous made his grand exit, smashing the transparasteel viewport and using a grapple to secure himself to the outside of the ship, where he walked up and over the ship's armor plates, back into a hatch where he caught the last escape pod. The Jedi would now have to deal with the already badly damaged and crewless Invisible Hand, while he made his way back to Utapau to report to Lord Sidious and plan his next moves. Head of State Dooku was dead, and the Confederacy was now in a state of emergency, and with Grievous being the supreme commander of the CIS Armed Forces, he now also assumed the responsibilities of the Head of State. The Confederacy's survival depended almost solely on his survival, and it wasn't long before clone intelligence units pinpointed his location. It was as he was informing the Separatist Council of the decision to move them from Utapau to Mustafar that Obi-Wan Kenobi quite literally dropped in, and challenged him to one-on-one -on -one lightsaber combat. And as their duel began, the forces of the 212th Attack Battalion arrived to engage Grievous's forces as well. From the rafters of Hangar 10, to the streets of Pau City via Wheelbike and Boga, and finally to a small landing platform in an adjacent sinkhole, their clash was long and drawn out. No doubt that Grievous's previous combat prowess was hampered by the damage he suffered at Bospity and Coruscant at Mace Windu's hands. 
As hands and lightsabers were lost by both opponents, the combat distance closed and fists started flying, enough to where Kenobi managed to open up Grievous's chest cavity and a few well-placed blaster bolts combusted the general's internal organs from the inside. General Grievous's grisly demise kicked off the final stages of the Clone Wars, and with it, the establishment of the New Order. And while nothing was left of his physical organs, his body was recovered from Utapau by Imperial technicians and stored in a warehouse. Leading up to the Battle of Yavin, the Imperial Department of Military Research developed the experimental Terror Troopers, cybernetically augmented special forces agents whose face masks were inspired by Grievous's very own, and they were used to great effect against Subject 1138 before the project was abandoned. Around a year and a half after the Battle of Yavin, a fringe Imperial scientist, Nikolai Kinsworthy, recognized that Grievous's body could be utilized for a special combat droid, and developed the dreaded NK Necrosis Project, which was luckily destroyed by a group of spacers on Kashyyyk before it could be used to any real effect. While the rest of Grievous's body was destroyed with NK Necrosis, his original face mask managed to survive, and wound up on the ultra-discreet Invisible Market, where it was bought and transferred to the collection of none other than Grand Admiral Thrawn, who had studied and admired the General's tactics and strategy. In the years since his death, the figure of General Grievous has been painted a multitude of different ways by the media of different generations. To those who were born after the Clone Wars, Grievous was a proverbial mustache-twirling villain, whose dastardly deeds were constantly foiled. To those who actually lived through it, he was a sadistic monster, who waged total war with no regard for civilian casualties. But to the Kalish, he was hailed as a hero, one of the great tragic mythological figures that were present in their vast pantheon of gods, and he earned a place amongst them. This redo of one of my past transmissions was commissioned by the Framinator on Patreon. If you have any suggestions for future transmissions, don't be afraid to drop a comment. Special thanks to my patrons Wildcat144, JTrips1997, Wirefox Terrier, Dave the Grave, Zim the Despot, Matt Patton, Trav, Hawk2274, Cal Scarada, Angry Mutt, Chris Evans, Mayo4, Moonman, Noah Shane45, and The Framinator. If you'd like to support this channel and perhaps even commission your own video topic, please visit my Patreon to find out how. Link is in the description. In the meantime, keep your calm channels open for future transmissions, and uh, don't forget to subscribe. Tad Larkin, out.